Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be here to talk about some planning uh, for tax increases that we expect to see in 2013. My name is Dan Matarisi with McCauley and Asbury's Private Client Services Group. Today, I'm joined by Ravi Kanani. Ravi, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. I'm happy to be here. Well, a couple of the things that we're going to talk about today, uh, just kind of uh, casting uh, kind of the vision for, for today's conversation, we're going to spend a little time talking about some of the, the aspects of the Bush era tax cuts that w- will expire at the end of this year. And we talk about those those uh, provisions expiring. We mean that if Congress does nothing, inaction will lead to large changes in, in our tax codes. So that's the first thing we'll talk about. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about is the impact of the Affordable Care Act and, and some tax provisions within that legislation uh, that will come into play uh, for individual income taxes uh, come January of 2013. So, Dan, um we're going to be covering a lot of topics today. So um, let me just start out with uh, a question. What are the main provisions of our current individual tax system that will expire at the end of 2012? That's a great question, Ravi. And, and I think we'll, we'll touch on three main areas here, the first of which would be ordinary income tax rates. Uh, currently, our ordinary income tax, or our tax brackets, if you will, uh, the lowest bracket is, is taxed at 10%. So for all of us, our first portion of income is taxed at 10%. That goes away come January 1st. Uh, That 10% bracket was created by President Bush, um, and we've had it for quite a few years now, but the lowest bracket will be taxed at 15% come 2013. On the other side, the highest bracket or our highest marginal rate goes from 35% that is currently today to 39.6% come January 1st. So again, for married individuals, the highest bracket starts around the $360,000 range. So any dollar over $360,000 of taxable income currently taxed at 35% next year will be taxed at 39.6%. These are the rates we had in place during during Clinton's era. Um, so this is, is not by far not the highest we've ever had, but we just go back to the pre-Bush era tax rates. To piggyback, uh, to piggyback off uh, of your comments, um, we'd also like to mention that long-term capital gains rate is expected to go from uh, 15% to 20% if, if uh, Congress doesn't do anything about it. Um, a long-term uh, capital gains rate is a preferential rate uh, that is given to um, capital assets that are held longer than one year. Um, currently, there, that is taxed at 15%. Um, again, if uh, Congress doesn't do anything, we expect that to go up to 20%. Rob, that's a great point. And, and here's a question that I think that we're getting from a lot of people is, well, how do you think that may affect the market? Or how do you think that may affect uh, general economic activity? I, again, I'm not a, a, a financial guy through and through, but my opinion is that if we get closer to the end of this year, and we, we after the elections especially, uh, we think that there's a good chance that that rate will go from 15 to 20 percent. I suspect that you may see a large sell-off in the market, people locking in that 15% rate and potentially getting out of uh, some securities that they've held long-term. Ravi, what do you think about that? I, I would I would have to agree with that. If uh, if after the election we don't see any action from the Congress, um, I, I, I expect a good, good sell-off in the market. Uh, and, uh, and even people that I've talked to uh, around the area, lawyers and financial advisors, they've, they've said the same thing. Yeah. Um, again, we're, we're not financial advisors, so um, <laughs> don't take our advice. Yeah, we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave the real advice on whether or not you should sell to the, the true financial professionals. But again, just our opinion is that we may see some sell-off here towards the end of the year. While we're on the topic of, of, of the markets, another important aspect of the Bush era tax cuts uh, that expires is, is the concept of a qualified dividend. Um, previous to, to the Bush era tax cuts, dividends were taxed at, at ordinary income rates, the same way salaries taxed or interest would be taxed. But there was a provision in the Bush era tax cuts that said a qualified dividend, which essentially is a dividend from a, a U.S. company or certain qualifying, qualified foreign companies uh, to where they're paying out their profit. If you have a qualified dividend, it is taxed at the same rate as long-term capital gains. So that was 15% under current tax law. The issue is that expires at the end of the year, meaning qualified dividends are now taxed or they go back to being taxed 
as ordinary income as they were previously taxed. So to put a, some some dollars around this, uh, let's assume that that John has one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of qualified dividends in two thousand and twelve. Those qualified dividends, regardless of what level his other income is at, those qualified dividends are taxed at a fifteen percent preferential rate. So that's a total tax of twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars on the hundred and fifty thousand of dividends. If we assume in 2013 that the qualified dividend provision goes away, which again, that will happen if Congress doesn't act, those same $150,000 of dividends are now taxed at whatever marginal ordinary income rate John is at. So if John is a high earning individual in the highest income tax bracket, that means in 2013, those $150,000 in dividends will be taxed at 39.6%, the highest marginal rate in 2013. So that's $59,400. So we go from $22,500 in 2012 on his qualified dividends to $59,400 of tax on the same $150,000 in dividends. Well, what does this mean to the markets? I don't know. I mean, we've certainly taken away some of the benefit of investing in in U.S. corporations. Um, and there's a lot of speculation that, that that provision may make people hesitant uh, to invest as much in U.S. corporations. We'll talk a little bit later about how we may have some planning opportunities around uh, that, that provision expiring. Uh, but nevertheless, qualified dividends, they, they lose a lot of the benefit that they previously had under, under the Bush era tax system. Okay, Ravi, now that we've talked a little bit about uh, some of the, the Bush era tax uh, provisions that are expiring, uh, moving along to the Affordable Care Act, uh, what impact uh, will that have potentially on, on individuals on their 2013 income tax returns? That's a great question, Dan. Um, well, under the provisions of the new law, which take effect in 2013, most taxpayers will continue to pay the 1.45% Medicare tax on their earned income. Single, single people earning more than $200,000 and married couples earning more than $250,000 will be taxed an additional 0.9% on the excess over those base amounts. So basically, a person earning $200,000 uh, or more will, will end up paying 2.35% on, on his share of income. Um, and the uh, same goes for uh, self-employed individuals. Self-employed individuals who currently pay 2.9% um, Medicare tax on their earn, uh, earned income will end up paying 3.8%. Um, another thing uh, add, to add to that is um, we, we are going to have 3.8% tax on investment income. We keep in mind we have never had that before so this is this is going to be a completely uh, new tax on uh, unearned income yeah it's a great point uh, previously as Ravi alluded to uh, the Medicare surcharge or Medicare tax uh, that we pay is, is deducted from our payroll that's the most common way you see it and Ravi also mentioned that uh, for self-employed individuals they pay their Medicare tax and what we call self-employment tax or SC tax when they file their return Historically, it's only been applied, or the only income subject to those taxes are earned income. Uh, but in addition to the 0.9% the surcharge on earned income, which brings Medicare from 2.9% to 3.8%, we also have that th same 3.8% surcharge being applied to investment income for individuals that are above the thresholds that, that Ravi mentioned, which is $200,000 of AGI uh, for single individuals and 250000 for married individuals. So what does this mean? I mean, essentially, capital gains, investment um, income, which is interest income, dividend income, uh, your share of pass-through income from partnerships or S-corps or from owning an LLC, all of those types of income will now be subject to this Medicare surcharge of 3.8% which we've never had. Um, it's especially relevant to, to planning as you consider S-corporations. S-corporations have been used as uh, an income tax planning strategy because pass-through income from S-corporations, even if you are active in the business, is not subject to self-employment tax. Well, now this, this Medicare surcharge will apply to all pass-through income, including that of S-corps. So if I go back to our previous example uh, of dividends, we talked about John having 150000 of dividends in 2012. And his federal income tax burden on that 150000 of dividends was $22,500. Again, just the flat 
In 2013, assuming John is in the highest income tax bracket, he will now pay 39.6% on that $150,000, which is $59,400. He'll also pay the 3.8% Medicare surcharge on that $150,000 of qualified, or excuse me, of dividends. That's $5,700. So in total, uh, John will pay $65,100 on the dividend income he receives in 2013 compared to $22,500 that he paid in 2012. It's a $42,600 increase on the same type of income from 2012 to 2013. That large of an increase, that material of an increase, necessitates that we look at the situation more closely and potentially consider what planning opportunities exist around that. We'll talk about a little bit of that, um, a little bit of that later, uh, and some planning opportunities that may exist for for dividends. But again, keep that in mind. These are these are pretty large increases that are coming for our investment income when you compare a 2012 tax impact to 2013. I just uh, I would just like to add uh, something uh, to that. Um, Keeping in mind um, the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, the, the, the law requires applicable individuals to carry minimum essential health coverage for themselves and their individuals or otherwise pay a shared responsibility penalty for each, uh, each month of noncompliance. This, this does not go into effect in 2013. Um, it, this, this will be phased in starting 2014, 15, and 16. And after that, um, it, it'll, it'll, it will increase based on uh, cost of living adjustment. So um, it, it, we expect that to be $95 in 2014, $325 in 2015, and $695 in 2016. Hey, Ravi, that's a great point. I think especially in a time where we have elections and, and we hear a lot on the news and there's a lot of political uh, commercials and whatnot, it's important to mention that the, the individual mandate that Robbie just talked about does not come into effect in 2013. However, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act are being funded by these Medicare surcharges uh, that we just spoke about. So the funding is starting uh, in 2013 uh, and then the individual mandate, again, kicks in 2014, 15, and 16 uh, over time. One of the other items relevant to the Affordable Care Act is, is its impact on the medical expense deduction. And currently, uh, we get to deduct on reimbursed medical expenses um, as an itemized deduction on our tax return, as long as they exceed 7.5% of our adjusted gross income. Well, the Affordable Care Act takes that 7.5% um, and, and bumps it up to 10%. So if I have $100,000 of adjusted gross income, I have to have more than $10,000 of unreimbursed medical expenses before I get any benefit from the deduction. In 2012, I only needed 7,500 of unreimbursed medical expenses uh, to get some benefit from it. Again, we go from 7.5% up to 10% for the, for the deduction threshold. For most individuals, this deduction, especially if you're, you're employed and you have insurance that covers most of your expenses, most individuals are not over the threshold, even, on, even under current law. Where we, we think we'll see the biggest impact of this are, are those retired individuals who are residents in, in retirement care communities. Um, if you live in a continuing retirement care community, uh, even if you're in the, the lowest level of care, which is independent living, a portion of your monthly fees are still considered medical expenses and, and are deductible as such. If you're in the, the assisted living or the qualified nursing unit, uh, most of the time 100% of the fees you pay uh, for your retirement community are considered medical expenses because they are paid for the, for the promise of future care in that facility. So for those individuals, bumping the threshold from 7.5% to 10%, when you may be paying upwards to ninety or a hundred thousand dollars a year to live in one of these communities, you're going to be losing a large tax benefit uh, from the medical uh, the medical deduction of in 2013 as compared to 2012. To add to Dan's comment. Um, People, uh, people living in retirement community, higher income individuals, they're they're typically living off their investment income, um, it, so uh, it, to pay for to pay for their their retirement community. Um, 
So we not only we're not only going to see higher tax rates on that investment income, we're also going to see a uh, decrease in their medical deduction. Like Dan mentioned, a uh, portion of their expense is allocated to medical expense. Therefore, they can take the deduction on Schedule A. Um, so with, uh, with increase in the tax rate and uh, decrease in the deductions, well, they, they, can see, uh, they can see a higher tax liability going forward. And I don't think we focus on those individuals as often uh, in media as we, as we should. Um, retirement community happens to be a big industry yeah. in, 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 in our country. So um, I, I don't think we focus on that. We, we, we tend to focus on people that, that are working, that are, that are wealthy. Um, but I, I, th- I, I think that this is a bigger change for retirement, um, retired individuals. Than, than wealthy individuals. A- absolutely the case. I think uh, you know the retired individuals, one, they've made a decision to retire and start living their life on the assumptions of what their after-tax income would be and what they can afford. So now you're drastically changing that potentially by this Medicare surcharge, by how we change the way qualified dividends are taxed, uh, by how we treat medical expenses for their retirement communities. And these are the individuals who, as Ravi, as you said, don't have the ability to earn back this income in other ways, like those of us that are still working do. And for us in central Pennsylvania, or just Pennsylvania in general, which is a very popular state for retirees, second largest uh, percentage of, of our, excuse me, the second largest percentage of our population is retirees as compared to other states. I think it's important that we consider that and what effect this may have generally in our economy and, and this local area. Uh, so nevertheless, big changes coming uh, on, on, how, on how we tax investment income under 2000 and in 2013 under the Affordable Care Act, and also how we treat some medical expenses uh, that we've previously been able to deduct under the Bush era tax cuts. So Dan, um, given, given the expected tax increases we've talked about and various changes, what planning opportunities should we consider? Awesome question, Ravi. Uh, uh, although I am a tax guy through and through, and, and I do enjoy talking about certain details of tax law and different provisions, uh, what I think is probably a better use of all of our time is, is given these increases, what should we be doing now? Uh, which steps should we be taking? What things should we be considering? Conventional tax planning or conventional tax wisdom is defer income, accelerate expenses. That's generally what we'll try to do. So essentially, we'll push as much income as we possibly can into future years and accelerate as much expenses as we can into the current year. However, in a rising tax environment, the opposite is probably something we should, we should consider. How do we get more income into 2012 and thereby pay more taxes at the current rate structure, which we believe will be lower, uh, as opposed to deferring income to 2013. I will say this. A lot of these strategies are things to consider, but if if the elections go a certain way, or even if Congress um, decides to take different actions and extend the Bush tax uh, cuts, then a lot of these strategies may not be the right course of action. So what we're going to talk about today are things to consider. Uh, things that we think you should be thinking about over the next couple months uh, as we close out 2012. So the first item that actually is a little bit more of a a, a business uh, a type strategy to consider is the idea of foregoing bonus depreciation or 179 expense. Now, bonus depreciation allows us to to get a little bit more depreciation on normal capital assets. Um, and I won't get into the specifics of it, but essentially, um, we, we can expense more of the cost of an asset as opposed to spreading that expense over, over numerous years. Con- conventional wisdom would be, see, to, would be to take advantage of bonus depreciation, thereby decreasing the current year taxable income. In our, in our, our rising environment in 2012, as we prepare our 2012 tax returns and we look at the different options we have, we may want to consider foregoing bonus depreciation, thereby preserving the expense for future years. The same is true for 179 expense. Uh, 179 allows us to expense the full cost of the asset in the year it's placed in service. We may want to consider not taking either of those different depreciation provisions. That way we preserve more deductions for future years when the income tax rate would be higher um, as opposed to taking those in the current year when we believe we have a lower income tax system uh, than we will have in the near future. Another option we have is, is electing out of installment sales. An installment sale is, is uh, when, we, when we sell a capital asset and we're paid over time uh, in installment payments. 
As Robbie talked about earlier, currently we have a 15% long-term capital gain rate, and that rate is going to 20%. Uh, again, if Congress does nothing, that will go to 20% in 2013, plus we'll have the Medicare surcharge of 3.8% on, on investment income. An installment sale essentially says that as we receive principal payments over time, we pick up income and pay capital gains tax ratably over the installment period. At any point in an installment sale, you can elect out of installment treatment, and on your tax return, elect to pay tax on all of the gain from the transaction. So let's put some numbers around this. Let's say you sell an asset for $100,000 that you had basis of $50,000 in. Uh, So you have a 50% gross profit percentage. So you have $50,000 of gain on this transaction. If you receive $10,000 a year over a 10-year period, you would pick up $5,000 of capital gain each year. Uh, You'd also pick up interest. We'll we'll leave that aside. That that would also be part of the installment sale. Uh, But of the principal payments of of $10,000 a year, $5,000 would be treated as capital gains. Let's say we're in year three of of the arrangement. So we've already picked up $5,000 of capital gains in 2010, $5,000 in 2011, and normally we'd pick up $5,000 of capital gains in 2012. Instead, we can pick up the remaining $40,000 of capital gains in 2012, pay taxed at 15%, and and we would say locking in that 15% rate. Is this the right strategy? For some people, yes. Uh, if, uh, if, if it's the right time uh, to essentially you know, lock in those, those 15% rates, I think it's a good strategy, something that should be considered. In some senses, it's similar to what Ravi and I spoke about earlier and what we think will happen in the market. Uh, well, you're, where you will have people um, selling out of appreciated stock and locking in the 15% rate even on public securities. The installment sale is, is more so on closely held business stock or, or on, on sale of real estate uh, to where the seller may be holding the note. It's something for individuals to consider. We've had a few clients who are already embarking on that strategy. Uh, they feel confident that the 2012 rate of 15% is as low as it's going to be. Uh, so they're more than willing to pay taxes earlier Um, as opposed to paying it in the future at a higher rate. And I think you have to consider a lot of different things. You have to consider what you're going to do with with the cash that you'd otherwise have if you pay tax over time. Um, What does it cost you to pay the tax now? Do you have that additional the cash available to elect out of the installment tre- treatment. Um, but I think it's a question that should be asked for all of, all of you or all of your clients, um, if you're an advisor, that, that do have installment sales uh, uh, that are ongoing on their returns. Along those same lines, again, sticking with the long-term capital gain rate of 15%, um, if you have a C corporation um, where you have still accumulated earnings and profit from previous years that hasn't been distributed yet, and if you're the corporation that would otherwise qualify um, or your dividends would otherwise be treated as qualified dividends, you may want to consider making a special dividend uh, and essentially uh, getting more cash to shareholders at that 15% rate that we still have on qualified dividends. Again, recapping, qualified dividends, which are from a U.S. company or a qualified foreign, foreign corporation that are paid out of current or accumulated earnings and profit, are treated or are um, they get the benefit of the preferential long-term capital gain rate, which is currently 15%. If we get a chance to get more money out of a C-corporation to its shareholders, let's say the amount is $100,000. So the C-corp, closely held, smaller company, has an additional $100,000 that it's ready to distribute as a special dividend. In 2012, that 100000 is subject to a 15% flat rate for its shareholders. In 2013, that same $100,000 is taxed as ordinary income, so it could be as high as 39.6%. Plus, it also is subject to the 3.8% Medicare surcharge. So in total, that's 43.4% federal income tax due on that $100,000 of dividends as opposed to 15% uh, that was due in 2012. Again, if the corporation needs that money for CapEx expenditures, um, if it needs it for other things, then then obviously we don't have to rush to pay this out to shareholders. But it, it should be something that, that should be considered for some of the closely held companies that may be um, sitting on uh, some, some accumulated earnings and profit. The special dividends is not a strategy that we we necessarily can wait and see on. That would need to be done before year end. The installment treatment and the foregoing the bonus depreciation, those actually are elections we can make on the tax returns when they're filed uh, sometime in, in early 2013. So we actually have a little bit more time with those to really understand where the elections will pan out 
um, or if Congress will act with or without a change in our president, what, what may happen. The special dividends is a little more delicate, and I think it's important that we proceed with caution because you would have to do that before year end. And if you do it before year end, but by some reason uh, the, the Bush tax cuts are extended and qualified dividends are still treated as at the 15% rate, well, then we've really accelerated some income into 2012 that we otherwise did not have to. Uh, so I think that one is a strategy that I'm, I'm slow to, to get on board with. The, the timing needs to be right and the things need to fall in line, but nevertheless, it should be considered. Uh, similar to that, where, where there's not a lot of flexibility, is, is the idea of a Roth IRA conversion. Um, traditional IRAs, you get an upfront benefit uh, from an upfront tax deduction for putting money into a, a, or an IRA account. Uh, Roth IRAs, you don't get any deduction for putting it in uh, the account. And conversely, traditional IRAs, when money comes out, you pay tax on the distributions. Roth IRAs, you do not pay tax on distributions when the money comes out. Starting in 2010, the income limitation for converting from a traditional to a Roth IRA uh, went away. So anyone, uh, regardless of their income level, can convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. When you do so, you have to pick up income uh, to the extent that the money in the IRA has not been taxed previously. So it's usually a big income hit when you convert from a traditional to a Roth IRA. For individuals who believe that tax rates are going up drastically, um, and again, retirement income is taxed at ordin as ordinary income. So uh, if you're taking a distribution from an IRA in 2012, it would be taxed at the highest marginal rate, uh, whatever you're subject to. Uh, so let's say you are in the highest tax bracket, that'd be 35%. That same dollar of distribution next year is going to be taxed at 39.6%. So you have a 4.6% increase that we've talked about in the highest marginal rate. Some individuals believe they'd rather convert their full traditional IRA to a Roth now, pay 35%, and it grows over time, and they never have to pay tax on distributions in the future, and who knows what future rates would be. There's a lot of factors that go into whether or not you should convert your traditional to a Roth IRA, many of which are on the financial side. And I would say keep your financial advisor, or they would be really the biggest driver of this conversation. Although there are large tax impacts to a conversion, it's important to consider how you'd be paying this tax. Would you take money out of the IRA to pay the tax? How much time do you have left before you start taking distributions from the IRA? All of these things go into the, the evaluation or the calculation of whether this is the right strategy. With a Roth IRA conversion, you do have the ability to recharacterize back to a traditional IRA. Uh, so even if you convert it, you have the opportunity to characterize back and certainly and essentially undo the conversion in a future time uh, within some certain time requirements. So again, this is not a, a one and done where if you convert it before your end, you're kind of out of luck. You do have the opportunity to recharacterize back to a traditional. However, again, I would say use your financial advisor um, and, and rely on them to really walk through this uh, analysis instead of essentially doing it only for the tax piece of it. This is not a tax-only decision as it relates to your retirement account. So, Ravi, I know we've mentioned before that we are not financial advisors. We are, we are tax guys. Uh, however, <laughs> I, I think that the changes in how investment income is taxed uh, may have an impact on, on how financial advisors work with their clients to structure their portfolios. Can you talk about a little bit uh, of a change that we may see in portfolio structurings that may take advantage um, of some of the beneficial rules for investment income? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a this is a great opportunity to talk about um, making some adjustments to your portfolios to take advantage of municipal bond interest exclusion from taxable income. Um, uh, Prior to 2012, you were seeing a uh, 15% tax rate on qualified dividends. So after tax, you were you were getting a getting a good return on your on your dividends uh, dividend income, where interest income was being taxed at you know regular ordinary income rate. Um, post 2012, um, if uh, if Congress doesn't do anything about it, uh, taking any action, we might see those rates go up to ordinary rates of uh, close to 40%. Um, and, and, and clients may not see a good return on that investment. So I think uh, I think people have to take a look at uh, municipal bond bonds again uh, and, and, and to see if that makes sense uh, make, makes sense for them uh, to, to take advantage of uh, after tax return you know that may be higher than uh, going with uh, dividend income. I think that's a great point. I mean, your after-tax return on a, on, a, on a qualified dividend, 
um, you know, you, as you Ravi alluded to, you're paying 15% in 2012. That same dollar of dividend next year, you're paying 39.6% ordinary income plus the 3.8% uh, Medicare surcharge, now up to 43.4%. It's really eating into your after-tax return. All of a sudden, municipal bond interest, which may or may not have more risk, depending on the bonds you invest with, um, they start to look more attractive. So, again, this is us, not financial guys here, somewhat of speculation. Do we see people start to look long and hard at municipal bond portfolios as, as a better alternative uh, than traditional corporate bonds, money market accounts, qualified dividends, which we've seen as a large part of our market? Beyond the tax side, what effect does that have on our economy? Again, taxes drive behavior. People will make investment decisions based off of the the tax impact of them, not only off of the tax impact. It's just part of the the equation. Uh, so, you know, your financial advisors may be bringing these things to your attention over the next couple of months, even over the next year. And I the, I think that they're they're in in the right for doing so. I think it's it's important that we consider how our after tax return will be greatly. Um, altered or changed by some of the provisions we spoke about. Switching to another strategy, uh, there's a couple items of stock compensation, uh, stock options or restricted stock, uh, to where we do have some opportunity to think about accelerating income into 2012. As we spoke about earlier, and I know we keep saying it, the ordinary rates, highest marginal rates going from 35 to 39.6, plus we have this pesky Medicare surcharge which on earned income uh, will be 0.9%. It will take the Medicare contribution from 1.45 to 2.3. So that's in effect for, for our earned income, our salary. And stock compensation is considered earned income. There's something called an 83B election uh, that allows us to elect to treat what otherwise is restricted stock and not subject to federal income taxes. It allows us to treat that as compensation in the year that you receive the restricted stock, even if those restrictions haven't lapsed. Normally, you don't pick up compensation until the restrictions lapse and the stock actually really becomes yours, um, and you have what they call risk of substantial forfeiture. An 83B election says, even though the stock's restricted and I don't have to pick it up as income now, I'm electing to do so. Usually you do that if, if you believe that the stock is valued at a lot less today than it will be in the future when the restrictions lapse. Well, now you put on top of that that you believe you have a lower tax rate today than we will when the restrictions lapse, an 83B election might be a solid strategy for those individuals. Similar concept is the exercising of, of certain types of stock options. Uh, we'll talk about non-qualified stock options. When you exercise the options, you have to pick up compensation for the difference between the fair market value of the stock and the date of exercise and whatever your exercise price was. So if the stock is valued at $10 per share and you get to pay $5 per share, the difference between the $10 and the $5, which is $5, that is, that is treated as compensation to you. Well, you may see some executives looking to exercise a lot of options here towards the end of the year to lock in the current rate of 35%, assuming they're in the highest marginal bracket, and escaping that 0.9% surcharge, the Medicare surcharge that they would see next year if they, if they exercise the options in 2013. So for those of you that may have different types of stock compensation, you may want to talk to an advisor about whether or not 2012 is the right time to accelerate some of that income uh, and, and maybe take advantage of lower tax rates and escape that Medicare surcharge that may come into play in 2013. Well, we've gotten through a lot of material today, and uh, I think what we'll do next is, is open up the floor for, for some questions. Um, so why don't we do that? Uh, we'll move to some questions uh, from today's webinar attendees. So, Dan, um, here's a question that just came in. Um, We've talked about a lot, a lot of changes to income taxes. Um, can you can you shed some light uh, light on estate tax changes that, that you expect in, uh, to go into 2013? That's a great point. Uh, we didn't speak a lot about the estate and gift tax changes, but they are uh, equally as impactful uh, for some individuals. Um, in 2012, we have a lifetime exemption. Of, of about $5 million uh, per taxpayer. Uh, it's been adjusted for inflation, but we'll use round numbers. $5 million per taxpayer, so $10 million uh, per couple. Uh, so as long as you pass away with less than $10 million as a married couple, uh, you will not have uh, a federal estate tax. 
we also have a portability of, of that exemption amount between husband and wife, meaning if husband passes away, the wife automatically gets to use any unused exemption amount from the husband. Uh, previous to that, we used to have to, to draft uh, wills and to include something called a bypass trust or credit shelter trust uh, to essentially allow that, that exclusion to, to move to the surviving spouse. So the 2012 federal state tax laws are favorable in that sense, a larger exemption amount and more portability of that exemption between husband and wife. Starting in January, we resort back to $1 million, $1 million exemption uh, for, for taxpayers. So $1 million per taxpayer, $2 million as a married couple. Uh, and we go back to a 55% uh, rate on taxable estates as opposed to a uh, lower rate we have now at 35%. So potential large increases uh, for federal estate and gift tax, if nothing is done. Uh, unlike the, the income taxes, there already have been some, some bills that are making their way through our Congress to go back to what we had in 2009, which is a $3.5 million uh, federal estate exemption uh, and, and a, a rate that we had of, of 35%. Uh, they're floating around. Some individuals say we'll end up in the 3.5 range, again, back to two point. 2009 numbers. Others say that that will will stick or get an extension of the five million dollar exemption or ten million for a couple. Um, I don't think we'll go back to a one million dollar exemption uh, that we had uh, previous uh, to the 2009 law, only because that would really pull in a lot of estates uh, that Congress has essentially said they're they're not aiming after in our estate tax system. Uh, you know, one million may sound like a lot of money, but uh, that may may be just enough to retire with for. Um, certain individuals who were middle income or middle class taxpayers their whole life. Uh, so again, we have some large changes potentially happening. What do you do with that? Well, you probably take advantage of of the fact that that full $5 million uh, that we have as an exemption today can be used during your lifetime, meaning you can actually gift the full $5 million right now um, and, and avoid gift taxes in addition to passing away and avoiding estate taxes on that $5 million. So we've seen a lot of clients uh, talk about uh, creation of certain types of trusts. Um, we, we uh, Last webinar, we had uh, David Warren from Bridgeford Trust Company with us discussing how uh, the changing estate and gift tax landscape may necessitate uh, some trust planning um, or some asset transfer currently. Um, and we would encourage clients uh, of higher, higher net worth, anywhere from the five million and up range, uh, to really sit down with their planners and advisors before year end to look at whether or not we should do some planning and lock in uh, that five million dollar exemption right now in the event that it could go away. That's a great question. Please keep them coming. Another good question that just came in has to do with the topic that uh, I've been asked a little bit over the last year by some of our clients. There was actually a, a fake email or a fake Kiplinger email going around uh, speaking about this. And the question is, is it true that the amount my employer pays for my health insurance is now subject to income tax and, and taxable on my W-2? Ravi, why don't you answer that question? Um, the answer to that question is no. Um, it, as is now, um, the, the employer paid portion of your insurance premium will always be non-taxable to the employee. Um, starting 2012, though, you will start seeing um, a code for the amount the amount that your employer paid for your insurance premium uh, premium on in box 14. Um, just so that the IRS knows how much your employer paid uh, towards your insurance. Um, it's just another reporting requirement. It's it's not going to be taxable to the employees. And actually, I, I, I do remember seeing that email, and, and we I remember us discussing about it, and we actually looked in the email, and it turns out that it, that, that it was fake. So it, it's just another reporting requirement that you'll start seeing in 2012. Yeah, I, I, well said. And I think the one thing, if I may play devil's advocate, one may question why are they asking for this information? Well, uh, after looking at all the 2012 W-2s, if if employees if employers have to report the amount that they're paying for health insurance, the IRS and the government can tell exactly how much revenue they would generate if they started to tax that as compensation. So if they started to say that the employer portion that they pay on your behalf is treated as compensation, well, we know the exact amount of revenue that would be generated from taxing that because now we'll know what the true dollar amount is that each employee is receiving or each, each employer is paying on behalf of the employees. Here's another great question that just came in. Um, how have individual taxes uh, changed uh, over the last four years? 
Uh, that's, I think it's a timely question. Ravi and I always talk about how um, in an election year, especially this one, we seem to hear a lot about, about taxes in debates uh, on commercials. Uh, there's a lot of politicians who pledge for, for no tax increases uh, in their time in office. Um, so taxes are certainly a relevant topic. We talked a lot about how taxes will change from 12 to 13, but this question alludes to what changes have we had over the last four years. And again, my statement is not politically motivated. Uh, this is just the facts. We've had very, very little change to our individual income tax, uh, individual income taxes uh, over the last four years. So that would be 2009, 10, and 11, and 12. Uh, we have sim ex virtually the exact same system we had under President Bush, uh, but there has been some expansion of certain credits uh, to allow even, even uh, more benefit uh, for education spending. Uh, the American Opportunity Credit expanded the, the credit for qualified tuition expenses. And one of the larger items uh, was the removal of the cap or maximum, which, is, which was previously $1,500, on, on credits that were uh, in place for certain residential uh, efficient energy products, uh, specifically geothermal heat pumps and solar panels. It used to be that the credit uh, was 30% of the qualifying expenses but maxed out at $1,500. Um, in 2009, uh, that that maximum or that $1,500 cap went away. Um, and the credit is now 30% of all qualified expenditures. So if you put in a $20,000 solar panel, you'd have a $6,000 uh, income tax credit on, on your return. So to really summarize, there have not been many changes to our individual income tax system uh, over the last four years. The Bush era tax cuts were extended for nine and 10, and then they were again extended uh, for 11 and 12. So all things being equal, we've been operating under the Bush era tax uh, system for all of President Obama's uh, administration. So I think uh, it's time to uh, take in some questions. Um, first question we have is um, if I sell an asset with unrealized gain in December, but I actually want to continue holding the asset, how long do I have to wait to buy it back? That's a, kind of a good strategy. So it's it's an asset that, that we know we want to hold on to, but we want to take advantage of the 15% rate that we currently have. Um, and the, the answer to the question is you don't have to wait long at all. Um, you can buy back in essentially uh, immediately. The IRS has what we call the wash sale rules, but that relates to losses, meaning you cannot sell uh, stock for a loss and then get back into your original position uh, within a certain time frame of selling at a loss. But when you sell it again, you're essentially accelerating income, and as we know, the IRS doesn't mind if we uh, do something that, it, that results in us paying tax at a faster period. So to answer the question, uh, you can get right back into the position uh, with that asset uh, as soon as you would like. I would say give it give it a day or two just to make sure there's a clear distinction um, in the transactions, but other than that, you should be okay. Here's another one. Uh, will there be any changes to the qualitative nature of medical expenses that can be deducted? Um, i.e. the types of expenses that you can deduct on your Schedule A? The answer to that question is no. Um, the definition of the medical expenses will stay the same. The only thing that's going to change is the limit, which is going to go from uh, from 7.5% of AGI limitation to 10% 10, uh, 10 AGI limitation. Another question we have is, is it wise to wise for a C Corp to borrow money by the end of the year to increase dividends in 2012. That is a that is a loaded question. Uh, that is certainly a good one. Um, a couple things that uh, that that would depend on is uh, well, I guess one I'd have to understand how they would have uh, enough accumulated earnings and profit uh, with potentially not having cash uh, to to pay those dividends. Again, we can only get the qualified dividend rate and get that treatment if we have either current or accumulated earning, earnings and profit in the entity. Uh, so one, generally, I don't know if, 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 if you have to borrow, borrow money to have enough cash to, to make a dividend, uh, do you have accumulated earnings and profit? Two, what is the cost to you of borrowing that money? Um, if the cost to you of borrowing that money is, is you know, X percentage, um, and, you know, 4 or 5%, whatever it may be, creating income, uh, that you otherwise won't have, meaning creating income in 2012 that you otherwise wouldn't actually have in 2013, I don't know if I could get behind that strategy. Now, if you tell me that you you project you'll have cash in 2013 in the C-Corp to, to, to pay a dividend to shareholders, but you just don't have that short term in 2012, well, then, yes, maybe it is the right strategy to think about. 
And you'd also have to consider the time value of money. Uh, what does it cost you to pay that tax on your 2012 return uh, versus paying that tax a year a year later? Again, if we're choosing between 2013 dividend and the 2012 dividend, I say yes, choose the 2012 dividend, even if you have to some, borrow some money to do that. However, if it's well, we, we're not sure when we would have a dividend otherwise. Let's not borrow money just to create uh, to create income if we don't believe we'll have it uh, in 2013. We have time uh, time for one more question. Um, here's another one. How soon after we elect our next president do you think um, you know, we can expect some changes? <laughs> well, that is a, a fantastic question uh, and uh, one that, that is, is somewhat hard to answer. Um, yeah, I think it also, I mean, one, I'll say this, uh, it would depend strongly upon uh, how uh, certain things end up election-wise and what we have in Congress as well as, as the president. Um, I mean, right now, as it stands, uh, you would you would need, and uh, again, not to get too political, um, in order to have a repeal of the Affordable Care Act, um, thereby changing uh, the Medicare uh, surtax provisions that we talked about, you'd probably need to have a Republican-controlled Senate, a Republican-controlled House, um, and a Republican president. Um, if any of those are not there, you would, in some case, uh, we would we probably not have a repeal of that of that law, which means the Medicare surcharge that we spoke about uh, would more likely than not actually be in place for 2013. Uh, then, then there also becomes just the timing of everything. Uh, even if you do have um, uh, the, the things falling into place that would suggest we would have some some change in our tax code, uh, the question becomes: Well, we know when the president's takes office uh, after all the other things that need to happen, uh, you know, it's going to be after the first of the year already. Um, we've seen retroactive provisions before uh, where law is created and put into place retroactive to the first of the year. So it is not unprecedented that you would have tax legislation uh, in, in the first four to five months of the year that would be retroactive to, to January 1st, meaning we don't need this to happen before the end of 2012. Uh, and really, it doesn't even need to happen uh, for for much of 2013. Um, you know, again, an example: we we've had tax cuts come really late in the year. We've had tax cuts um, or tax changes come actually after year end, before returns were being filed um, in in previous years. Uh, so, uh, really, it's a tough question to answer. I think I do think, though, however, that pretty soon after the election, uh, November 6th, we will have more clarity. Uh, on what to expect out of Washington uh, as far as 2013 taxes are concerned. Uh, but I guess until that time, uh, you know, we really would have to rely on what the candidates are stating um, on the campaign trail. Um, and I think even a larger struggle for us is that what they're stating seems to be changing um, as well. Uh, so we're in a little bit of a, a wait-and-see uh, holding pattern as it stands uh, for 2013 right now. Well, thank you very much, guys. And uh, just to everybody out there, thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar sponsored by McConley and Asbury. And just as a reminder, you will be receiving CPE credit for attending this one-hour webinar. CPE certifications will be sent out via email within the next week. You'll be receiving a follow-up email to this webinar with a link to a short survey about the webinar that we would appreciate your feedback on. We will be posting a recap of today's presentation on our blog as well at www.macpass.com slash MA news. And uh, look for that post to be up in the next day or two. Have a great afternoon.